Giuliano Amato, very warm welcome. We know you in, yeah. in different capacities, in different incarnations. We know you as a person with so many regalia. You are a real polymath. You are an actor and also thinker. And you have shaped and influenced uh, the development of the European Union, competition policy, and obviously academic life uh, for so many generations of European lawyers and European competition lawyers. Uh, thinkers and actors as well. So I wanted to focus and to use this opportunity, this unique opportunity to discuss this four aspects, European Union and competition law primarily, but also if you have a few uh, moments to reflect also to ask your, for your reflections uh, on the development of, of digital economy and digital society and the role and the function of individual in, dig in digital uh, world. And also maybe a little bit on, on, on the development of, of academic, academic life. I also wanted to express my gratitude for your continuous support for so many um, former students and current students of European University Institute and probably many other academic institutions, La Sapienza and, and St. Anna in Pisa and many others as well. Uh, so let us begin with the first block namely the European European Union you are known as kind of a protagonist of the of the idea of of Europe um uh, being a, a sui generis political entity but what we often see and I hear also your criticism of this very simplistic vision of European Union as a kind of a sum of the sovereignties of its member states uh, we, went, we witnessed this with Brexit, and unfortunately, I also see it in, in this uh, simplistic vision being quite popular, dichotom dichotomic vision being quite popular among students in the UK at least. Would you be able, please, to reflect the, maybe not on the diagnosis of the problem, but maybe on, on how, how to, should we mitigate or treat this, this symptom, this, 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 uh, this systemic problem? Yeah. It is a systemic problem because, you know, when uh, mostly after World War II, the uh, idea of European integration became something to be somehow implemented, the historical model for integration was federalism. Now, federalism by itself implies that the sovereignty of uh, a bunch of the sovereign states should somehow transfer to a superior level the new federal state, reducing the member states to the level of decentralized uh, entities of government in a sort of unique a state. This was, in my view, against the history, the nature, and perhaps the feasibility itself of what our states could do. You know, 13 colonies are something different than uh, tens of states uh, with their histories, with their wars, with their armies, with their traditions, with their cultures, with their languages. So all of this history on the one side, due to the wars, the conflicts, and all of these horrible matters felt the need to cooperate, to do something together, to integrate somehow. But, but united in their diversities was their main aim and perhaps also defining the boundaries of what they could do together. Even the famous federalists of the Ventotene Manifesto, which was uh, one of the charters on the basis of which uh, the, in, the idea of integration was pursued, were perfectly aware that something was needed to unify decisions at the European level. Never in the future they had in their minds an individual member state could declare war 
fight against another European state, foreign policy, uh, defense policy, other matters should be unified at a superior level, but for the rest, states should remain and use their own diversities somehow to enrich the ensemble. To make it short, this what is exactly what we did for years and for decades. And this is a kind of system that works as long as member states are ready to cooperate with each other, to use their diversities as enrichments, as I said, of a single uh, uh, purpose, not to conflict with each other. The main problem we had to face throughout the years was how to preserve this sort of goodwill of the member states to work together, to be so confident as to transfer some of their functions to the superior level. And it worked. It worked. We created an, an integrated market. We gave ourselves a, a sort of a single competition policy. Uh, we reached the point of having in competition policy a European authority and in a sort of seamless web, as it was defined, the national uh, uh, authorities networking with each other, harmonizing the rules, harmonizing the decisions. An excellent example, but not the only one the wonderful job made by the European Court of Justice brought the Europeans to having European rights that were not created from above by the court, but found by the court in the common constitutional traditions of the member states. So diversity generated a sort of single patrimony that was the patrimony of the European identity after a while, after a while, because uh, international crisis, economic difficulties, terrorism, waves and waves of migrations. We know all of these matters. Some of our uh, uh, national identities reacted the uh, will to cooperate with each other started having also on the other side the will to defend each uh, national identity against the others and against Europe. Uh, facing the difficulties, a very easy way of finding consensus in politics was, you know, my fellow citizens, you are unsatisfied, things are not going well. Doing on our own, we could do better. Defending ourselves against this Europe that allows the localization of our companies into uh, other parts of the world, that allows all of these immigrants to enter and to steal our jobs. Well, let us defend ourselves from all of this. Let us build up walls around our borders. And, and they gain votes by doing this. This is something that is going on also now, but, and I go to finishing, now something new is happening. The pandemics, war, climate change, and I mention all, only these matters, but migration itself, are demonstrating that if I do on my own, I can't do better. Words become things for me. Brexit is an inexorable example of this. Brexit was the utmost outcome 
of this spreading of uh, national defense against the others. Let us take control again on our matters. Brexit arrived and after some years in the UK, they don't speak about it because it's a very difficult topic, but the loss, the loss, not only of ideas, but of goods and products in the supermarkets, of gasoline at the gas station. It, life is much more complicated. They are realizing that national interest might be better served by working together. And this is what is increasingly happening nowadays. Uh, let me mention the pandemics because it's really a formidable example. All of us know that in health matter, the European Union has only, uh, we lawyers say, a complementary competence, something that can support what member states do, but without the power to adopt autonomous decisions. Well, when the issue arrived of buying vaccines from one or two big companies, the member states realized that it was much more for them, for each of them and for all of them to delegate the European Commission as a buyer sort of proxy in the name of all of them. And therefore they privately, not by any public decision, decided that the upper level was better than the national level to do what? To protect the national interests. And this is where we are now, where we are increasingly going now. It is a fact that after the pandemics, the next generation EU brought to the first gigantic operation of European financing through debt, through European bonds of uh, works, uh, uh, industrial activities, public works, etc., in each of the member states under the supervision and the direction of the European Commission. Well, something is changing. Indeed, and let me let me then, uh, move from one kind of simplistic perception, the simplistic perception uh, of of Europe, to simplistic perception of the relationship between state or the public and the market. This is one also one of of the themes of your of your continuous engagement, and you 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 were trying to articulate this. Uh, um, observation and this element of the relationship of this kind of dialectical relationship between the state and the market is that the markets uh, the very idea of markets envisages and presupposes uh, the government and we also see we, we also see that european union is trying to be more active in in selecting different elements uh, including competition policy, maybe in digital markets would be one example, but maybe there are others as well. So how would you see the role of, of, of the public authorities in shaping the markets and maybe through competition policy, building the bridge with the second block? Well, it is a complicated matter. And also how we react to public interventions or to the lack of public intervention also depends on the context. The context is extremely important because, you know, in principle, you and I and many others have written this more than once, the market could not exist without state rules. This is obvious to anyone who is aware of how history has been shaping the relationship between the market and, and the, the states before the European Union and, uh, and the similar. 
since the origin of the market, I have repeated the hypothesis, Douglas North, and the difference between the market inside a village uh, where everybody knows everybody else and the market when it expands and uh, creates relations between people who don't know each other. The buyers arrive, ask for something, the price is this, they buy, and the seller doesn't know the buyer. So at that point, the market exists, but how can you rely on somebody whom you don't know? The payment will arrive, and if it does not arrive, what can you do? Declare war to somebody that you don't know privately in another village, in another city. So as long as it's a very small market, in a village where you know your buyer, well, you don't, don't need anything else. You go to his house, you knock to the door, and you say, you haven't paid me. And the next time, my tomatoes won't go to you. And that's enough, and it works. But if the market expands, and as it should expand to create wealth, to create growth, etc., you need an institution that cares about possible conflicts, that creates rules, that creates systems of payments, that creates tribunals where you can go and claim. And uh, the tribunals having the power to uh, summon uh, your buyer, et cetera, and, and to adopt a decision binding for both of you. Would um, could a market take care of itself, as an ideology says in this case, without state institutions? It could not. So in general and elementary terms, the market does exist as long as there is a framework of public rules and institutions that guarantee somehow for what is happening in the market itself. Within these limits, uh, okay, no objection, but it may also happen that the state enters and says, well, I want you to produce this, not to produce that. For our community, it is important that economic operators instead of spending resources here, spend resources there. At this point, it's not instrumental to the functioning of the market, but it is interfering with the functioning of the market. How far in relation to what aims, etc. Here, the discussion, uh, has a sense. And here there is, there has to be what in Canada they call a reasonable accommodation between conflict, frequently conflicting views and conflicting interests. For sure, there are situations in which without public rules, the market goes toward outcomes that are against the interests of the same players of the market. Uh, we uh, experts in competition law uh, refer frequently to disruptive competition. Leave taxi drivers alone without rules in Santiago del Chile, as Pinochet did several years ago. It will be a disaster. Everybody will feel entitled to transform his or her car into a taxi. Uh, collecting people uh, 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 to transfer them here or there, 
but nobody would guarantee for the security uh, standards respected or not respected by each taxi driver. The number of taxi drivers could be insufficient or even more than sufficient. The level of tariffs could be compatible, not compatible. A taxi market without rules is inconceivable. It's a case of disruptive competition. In these times, in these times, we have another phenomenon. After many, many years of refinance in the 90s and in the first years of this century, the main propensity of private capital is to go to investments that guarantee an easy and short in time return. I invest in your company if you assure me that every quarter I will have this return. Without this, I will withdraw my money and would finance something else. In times of intense technological change, of innovation that is needed, investments that produce their out outcome in a longer time are essential. And the market provides for this investment with great difficulty wary of the long-term risks. Generally, you need public money to finance private investments that create innovation and have the necessary time to produce what they are expected to produce. Nobody objects to it, but are there conditionalities? Up to which point conditionalities are admissible? How far can you rely on what the public has in mind for this money to produce? How far you need the creativity of the private operator that uses this money and produces the innovation. Here we have a huge problem. Let me give you an example that is completely foreign to uh, our economies and our systems, that is China nowadays. If you try to understand why uh, the Chinese economy is now reducing its uh, traditional uh, uh, rate of growth, one of the reasons is that in the last years, the intervention of public authorities in economic decisions has been growing and growing. And here we arrive to my old point, the dilemma of liberal democracies, because on the one side, you need the market to freely expand what is typical of uh, private uh, decision makers, uh, deciding that something makes sense, risking adopting decisions. On the other side, you have the public that says, but we have to reach this goal. We have to respect uh, these uh, limits. Uh, there are these red, uh, red lines, etc. How far can the public go? So even a defender of the necessary role of public intervention, as I am a defender of competition law, I'm aware that there are limits beyond, beyond which uh, this public intervention is uh, damaging the system, no less than free decisions of private in, uh, operators beyond certain limits can damage the system. So 
a reasonable accommodation is needed. One of my points was, do we share the same uh, 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 sensitivity toward uh, these limits? No. And no, no for a, a reason of values was my conclusion 25 years ago in the book that you wanted somehow to celebrate on antitrust and the bounds of powers because some of us in terms of values are more fearful of public power than of private power and therefore the boundary is uh, somehow uh, 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 the boundary for public intervention is stricter, is narrower. Others are more fearful of private power, and therefore they tend to be more generous in accepting public intervention. A reasonable accommodation is needed between these two viewpoints that remain. You are in the UK. If you are a labor voter, you tend to be more fearful of private power. If you are a conservative voter, you tend to be more fearful of public power. What can I do? I have to accept both of you. Indeed, and what is also interesting when you, when you mentioned uh, your your seminal book, which uh, influenced so many uh, generations actually already, because it's already more than twenty five years old uh, of of competition, European comp primarily European competition lawyers. And when we were discussing with you an opportunity to to uh, publish a new book, a little bit of product placement here, um, we have agreed at the very beginning that it will not be kind of liberal decorum, which would be, which would be much easier uh, endeavor, but a, a, an attempt to invite uh, the very impactful competition law and economic uh, and policy thinkers to reflect upon the development of European competition policies through the prism of your original book. And in in, in, the, in this volume, which, 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 which features um, really a lot of, of great names, uh, which we, we, we which have uh, reflected on 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 the pre on the previous book, let's say Eleanor Fox, Frederick Geni, Miguel Poyares Maduro, Giorgio Monti, uh, Marcus Komnenos, Liam Dum, Stavros Macris, Ginevra Bruzzone, Roberto Pardolesi, Anna Gerbrandi, and also your afterward. We, the the main conclusion, or at least one of, of, of the conclusions which I take into for myself, uh, having the privilege and honor to edit this the, the, this this book, is that we we cannot really uh, employ competition policy or can pursue competition policy relying exclusively on its two professional arms. Uh, on uh, juristic arm on and on economic or econometric arm. Both arms are essential and inevitable, indispensable for, for competition policy. But in hard cases, and we are mainly interested in hard cases because simple cases are self-executing, so to say. And here I revert to you as a constitutionalist more, who uh, you are more familiar with dealing with this trade, with balancing and uh, between legitimate legitimate values, selecting one which should outperform or out be given priority. We need this, what you mentioned, uh, what you label um, reasonable accommodation. So how do we apply this public interest or reasonable accommodation uh, vision in addressing complex competition law and policy matters? Well, this is, uh, the, in my view, the essential part uh, of our job as, uh, let's say, experts in competition law. Uh, the first prerequisite is, as you know, this is my view, being and remaining aware while working on it of what competition law is about. Competition law is about power. It's not by chance that its other name, 
the most common name is antitrust. Antitrust be, means being against the trust. And trust, technically speaking, is just an, an organization of uh, more than one company working together. But in the notion of antitrust, there is the perception that by putting together more companies, you might produce an amount of power that is disruptive of the correct functioning of the market. And why it is disruptive? Because the market is where, due to fair and equal competition, several economic operators can exercise their freedom, can produce goods for consumers that are free to choose among different offers. This is the functioning market. If somebody in that market becomes so powerful as to exclude competitors or to reduce for competitors the room to continue their activity freely and reduce the choice for the consumers, here Senator Sherman arrives and said antitrust is needed. Competition law is the guarantor of the freedom of the market, of the freedom of all the producers, of the freedom of the consumers. In principle, there shouldn't be any power in the market. It should be a context of free people exchanging goods, uh, labor, whatever, among themselves. In principle, power should be reserved to the king or to the parliament or to the prime minister, to the institutions that are conferred by the legitimate sorts, the Pope, Almighty God, the electors, the power to decide for others. No private person, in principle, should have the power to decide for others. Instead, this is what happens when in the market, somebody, trust or not trust, is above the others in terms of economic power, and therefore his or her decisions are binding without any legal uh, 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 sort of legitimation, but binding because the others have to accept them. So this is what antitrust competition law is about. Now, what happened? Mostly in the 90s, in the United States, in my view, is just to face an aggressive foreign competition that was arriving, Japanese and other center in the American market. The traditional rules that had been applied since the times of uh, Senator Sherman and, and, and the antitrust uh, law, were somehow loosened. It was an excellent operation because an excellent school, economic school, the Chicago school, explained to us, and it, they had done it since the 60s of the last century, that several principles that we were applying were objectionable because uh, antitrust law is not only about law, but is also about economics. And in economics terms, 
making an economic analysis of our rules and of the factual context to which the rule had to be applied, implied that, for instance, not every limitation of freedom of contract is a limitation of competition. Because if in that market, competition requires big producers to have their networks of distributions and they use franchising, for instance. Well, there is competition among different franchisers, Armani, Gucci, Valentino, uh, Christian Dior and others. They have their networks and compete with each other. Inside each of their networks, the relationship between franchisor and franchisee, there are limits to the contractual freedom, mostly of the franchisee, but also of the franchisor. Don't sell there, don't sell here, sell like these, sell, sell like that, etc. If you think that any limitation to freedom of contract is against antitrust, you prohibit this, which is a great useful development of the market. Competition remains, competition is strengthened, and therefore be happy with these limitations of the freedom of contract. This is what they uh, were saying also other things, but you can't go beyond a certain limit also saying these things because after a while, any intervention of competition authority was considered uh, possibly against uh, uh, potential good developments. And therefore, mergers were admitted due to which the future competition on, in that market was reduced. But if immediately, due to the merger, there was a reduction of prices for the consumer buying those goods, consumer welfare was protected and enhanced. And here this notion of consumer welfare limited to having the same product at a reduced price in the immediate future became dominant. But what could happen in the not immediate future with the reduction of competitors? What could happen is if out of this merger, one of those trusts too powerful that Senator Sherman wanted to fight emerges. Here between the United States and Europe, a difference remained. There is a famous case, General Electric Honeywell, a merger that the Americans gave the green light to, while the European Commission said no, because it's true that in the immediate future there will be a reduction of prices to the benefit of the consumers, but in the not immediate future, the contrary may happen, and we say no. The Americans reacted by saying, we are more humble in assessing the future and therefore we allow this thing to happen. They allowed this thing to happen. They allowed other things to happen. The big tech arrived. And inexorably, inexorably, they themselves were forced to realize that my God, antitrust is about power. And now there is too much power around. What can we do? Obviously, there are also protagonists of these big changes. Aaron and Bork were the protagonists of the previous change. A young, uh, more student than scholar at the time, Lina Khan, was the protagonist of the Amazon paradox, not of the antitrust paradox. We can't allow these things to happen. 
because there is too much power around. So here is where we are now, a sort of return to the awareness of what antitrust is about, which implies, I tell you, something that I consider both positive and negative, because again, I stick to the reasonable accommodation uh, always in relation to any kind of context. Because for those who thought that antitrust was about consumer welfare, well, what is happening? Are we pursuing multiple goals through antitrust? Are we pursuing fairness? Are we pursuing neutrality? Are we pursuing innovation? Are we fighting these equalities? Just a moment, but my answer is here. Don't mind, it may happen, of course. A competitive market is by itself protecting fairness, is by itself protecting neutrality by the big platform vis-a-vis those who use the platform for their services. Otherwise, there is an exclusionary kind of abuse. It's not that you can't pursue multiple goals by using your antitrust tools, exclusionary power, exploitative abuse, margin squeezing, unjustified refusal to deal. It is when you want to pursue these goals by using tools that are out of your toolbox. This is the risk now of Lina Khan. By enthusiasm, she might bring antitrust beyond its boundaries. Lina Khan, i using her as a symbol of the aggressive antitrust, but the experts in our fields are well aware of the famous Facebook case and that uh, the Bundeskartell Amt opened years ago and that has now eventually arrived to a decision of the European Court of Justice is, let me put it in uh, the most brutal terms, is violating the rules on uh, private data protection, a violation of antitrust. Initially, this seemed to be the decision of the Bundeskartellamt. There were different uh, decisions of the co German courts, and eventually the uh, reasonable accommodation was not by themselves, because this is another field. This is a power, a private power, that the protection of privacy has to take care of by itself. But the violation of those rules could be a symptom, an evidence that uh, with other elements connected can be used also by antitrust authorities to say this is an abuse of power. I must say, I understand that I'm speaking too much, but this is where we are now. Uh, I must say that it is easier for us Europeans than for the Americans, because throughout the years, we have preserved some aspects uh, fundamentally having to do with the interpretation of our article now 101 and 102 of the treaty due to which we can reach 
some private conduct that are uh, 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 controversial, while the Americans have some difficulty, a clear example, refusal to deal. In the States, this is a case in which freedom of, of contract has always prevailed on any kind of antitrust assessment and therefore, I'm free to negotiate with whomever I want, full stop. So if I refuse to deal to, with you, what do you want? Uh, in, some, in some cases, we already in, in the past reacted by saying, but you could be running an essential facility, a platform, uh, a railway, uh, a grid for electric power that nobody else has and that cannot be uh, duplicated easily. There can't be competition in creating the same facility that you have. So in this case, you are an essential facility when you run a facility that cannot be duplicated. And therefore, I beg your pardon, but you have to negotiate with whomever might have a need or a reason to use your facility. The American answer I remember my great friend Nino Scalia when he, but even before he became a justice of the Supreme Court, he said, well, in this country, we don't know what essential facility means. It was too much. It was too much. They did know, but they prefer to ignore. No, essential facility is something that here does not apply. Here we have refusal to deal now. We have uh, remained with the essential facility. We uh, also beyond the essential facility still are consistent with our previous case law and interpretation of the, our antitrust principle that uh, refusal to deal has to have a reason, can't be unjustified and therefore here, an accommodation between freedom of contract and the reasons of competition is found. It's interesting, now we don't have the time to do it, but if you go to the States now, and if you read their recent decisions, they adopt a language that is very similar to the language of the essential facility without mentioning it. So there is a, a happy convergence between our two kinds of systems of antitrust law in which the weight of our European tradition is higher than it was in the past. Let me then continue with, the, with this issue and uh, transfer or transpose from, from, from symbolic Lina Khan who was the brilliant diagnosed and who ha had articulated uh, and promoted the idea that the, the that antitrust in in the early 2000s was not sufficiently proactive etc to european um incarnation of of, of the same kind of uh, semi iconic or very popular figure margaret vestager who combined several hats while being commissioner for competition she also uh, is executive vice president of the commission and thus had, having this ability again as a symbolic figure to use other means, uh, hybrid means. You were uh, for many years uh, in, in favor of all this hybridization, harm of fraud relationship of the European Union, but I, I try to, to project it on competition policy. So we have cut many we have made many procedural shortcuts the, the length of cases 10 years plus we have dma at least for digital money we have foreign subsidies uh regulation which is quite uh, ambitious and far-reaching too in 
In short, we have many instruments. So your toolbox as a regulator or as an enforcer, as a politician is much wider. Uh, exactly. as, as a surgeon, you, you were comparing law and medicine uh, in, exactly. in, in some cases. Um, your, your toolbox is much wider and thus you have to be more prudent. You cannot apply it mechanistically. You cannot rely on, on the wisdom of economics or the glosses of previous cases exclusively. They are important, but you need something about uh, accommodate uh, re reasonable accommodation stuff. But do you think we are on the right trajectory with empowering the enforcers and thus we need maybe to change their way of, of, of considering these cases. Maybe they shouldn't be so mechanistic or maybe they were never mechanistic. But what, what do you view on, on this new chapter well, of, of, of competition well, policy? The risk is there. The risk is there. Uh, also because, uh, you know, when people speak of the bureaucrats of Brussels, I react negatively because they say, why the bureaucrats of Brussels? In Brussels, uh, there are bureaucrats, uh, there are politicians, uh, there are political leaders, there are excellent officials, as in any state. And after all, a municipality of one of our capitals has more bureaucrats than Brussels. So, I mean, uh, please uh, stop with it. However, the temptation of giving to myself a rule and then applying mechanically, as you said, that this rule exists over there. And we have examples of this. We have examples, we don't have the time to enter. But having said so, let's say in principle, it is very much true what you were saying, that we have a toolbox happily due to the fact that antitrust, we discussed years ago, whether it made sense for us Europeans to have antitrust as a piece of the European Commission instead of being the antitrust and independent agency. I remember I was at the time president of the Italian Antitrust Authority. There was a sort of entente between me and my colleague who was chairing the Bundeskartell Amt to promote the transformation of the DG4 of the commission into the office of an independent authority instead of being the department under one of the commissioners, one of the members of the commission, because in our view, it would have been uh, independence would have been better. I, I don't enter in that discussion. The fact of the matter is that after many years, I tend to say, well, I'm glad that uh, we had no followers in that battle and that it has remained as it was because it has allowed to uh, uh, enrich both the toolbox of the anti-trust as such and the toolbox of regulations that the commission as such can adopt. And facing this new phenomena, mostly due to the big tech, therefore to digital platforms, digitalization in general, uh, circulation of uh, private data, uh, buying and selling of this data, profiling people, uh, all of these matters that have created an entirely new kind of issues uh, in the digital world something new that has to be protected, something new that has to be avoided, fairness and neutrality in, in new areas where they had never been applied. It, it, it is impossible 
to reach all of these phenomena by antitrust. Again, multiple goals with your tools, not multiplying your tools to reach the goal. This is something you can't do, but you have the other tool that is regulating these things, creating new rules, not trying to expand, to stretch the antitrust rules to reach what they can't reach. And this is again also where Americans are trying to learn something from us. I remember it was months ago, an article by, it was Thomas Friedman, a uh, uh, very influential uh, editor of the New York Times, wrote an article, the title of which was Europe Save, Do Save Us, because the need of new rules, Europe, you are learning, you are teaching the world how to regulate this new phenomenon. And here you see the difference with all its difficulties. The legislative process of the European Union is simpler, is simpler nowadays than the legislative process of the United States of America. They have there only a president and the Congress, but due to their political system, the difficulties of finding a reasonable accommodation, because generally they prefer unreasonable positions that face each other without any possible compromise, well, new regulations are extremely difficult. In Europe, we are demonstrating that it can be done. And so uh, the regul general regulation on data protection, the Digital Market Act, now the regulation that is almost ready on artificial intelligence, well, there are things that makes us, uh, make us unhappy, but there are also things that are satisfactory. Let us move the, uh, to the last part of our conversation uh, from competition policy uh, to more kind of uh, societal aspects, maybe individual aspects. I wanted to ask maybe for a few uh, uh, advices or recommendations or views of, of yours. Uh, the first one concerns this digital tsunami, the phrase point uh, very elegantly by, by uh, Roberto Pardolesi, uh, which we all face. And now with all this large, large language models, chat GPT, we are being bombarded with information. There is so much at our disposal and you have to prioritize, of course. On, on one hand, we uh, you were always in favor of this um, um, peripatetic style of, of learning, communicating. The diversity is the key value or created, which created Italy, essentially, you mentioned once, or maybe more than one, I, I heard it once, um, and Euro, Europe, United States, so diversity is the value, and also European University Institute nurtures this diversity, professors coming from different different uh, countries, and, re, uh, and students having this unique opportunity to cherry pick, to attend the seminars of different schools of thought, actually, and it was very um, a productive way of functioning and uh, developing yourself in kind of harmonious individuality. Now it appears to be that we, we, we are ex being exposed to too much information. Do you have some universal remedy to this to, 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 to this situation or we have to do it again by, by, by reasonable accommodation? No, and happily no. Uh, not only because our time is, is almost over, but because this is a very complicated part of our future. I have only a few things to say. Uh, uh, in, in a group I'm chairing, uh, we wrote uh, a booklet on artificial intelligence and uh, uh, the title of the book was taken from a, a Jesuitic principle, the substance of which is distinguished frequently 
in Latin, distinguere frequente, distinguish frequently. Because here you have a process of innovation that is great, so great that we don't even know where we exactly are going to, to arrive. Biotech, if you enter into what they are discovering, biotech, genetic interventions, etc., also the human being can profit in uh, uh, wonderful ways in the future for all, all of these new medicine based on a new science. At the same time, there are enormous risks that we run delegating decisions to algorithms is very much risky because algorithms are based on the past. They don't know the individual case that you have to decide about. They have not seen the eyes of the person that you have to judge about whether he is a liar or not whether he is a criminal or not. And therefore, we have to establish rules and say, no, human decisions of this kind cannot be delegated to the machine, to artificial intelligence, to algorithms. These are means that we can use to be aware of all the precedents. No human mind can uh, convey in, in a few seconds so many precedents as the algorithm can do. So let's uh, use it. But if we have to decide on somebody who is before us, we have to adopt the decision considering his or her specific features and character or, or whatever. So rightly, the regulation of the European Commission I was referring to before has four levels of risk that we run with these machines and at the highest level of risk, the prohibition of has to be adopted. But can we prohibit researchers from continuing their researches when they feel that there might be a problem, we can't do it. We can't do it. Uh, in that booklet, we conclude there has to be a sort of ethic principle. Ethics enter here, not the law. And researchers have to know those who produced the nuclear weapon several decades ago knew that it was very risky. And in my view, it was too late for Oppenheimer to uh, signal the risks to the president of the United States when the thing was already there, perhaps there so they should have been aware before and stop, but not because a law had said this to them. So diversity here applies and uh, let's see what happens. But we have reasons to be confident in this great future of innovation. And our yes. time now is over. I, I have the last uh, a last question. I, I'm trying to select uh, among those which are still left. Um, maybe uh, you can provide us a um, young generation of, of, of scholars with, uh, with some uh, recommendations. I, I also had, had a question about your views on the role of personalities. You have this privilege to work with so many great people and you have seen so many people in general uh, in all kind of uh, levels of hierarchy or hierarchical scale how does it feel have you identified maybe some which are really remarkable which attributes do these people have which can be somehow condensed into several sentences maybe you have something at the top of your head which you can share with us 
but you know, personalities, if they are strong, they exercise an influence on you and it may be useful and, and therefore one uh, thing that can be suggested to young scholar, young students or young scholars is not to remain somehow locked in their lockers where they study, but interact with uh, others. And uh, I'm convinced that one of the principles of my constitution in Italy, that our personality develops itself by the relationship with others, that relations enrich each of us mostly. If they are relations with people who had done or were doing something, had ideas, had uh, also roots to indicate to, to the younger. It happened with my teachers when I was studying law, old scholars that passed away. I'm an old man now, so my teacher passed away several years ago. In, in, in the political world that I was part of for some years of, of my life, certainly, let's say, Francois Mitterrand was a somebody that exercised an influence uh, 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 on me. He had such a vision of what was going on. I, I still remember, I still remember a meeting at the beginning of the uh, war in the Balkans. It was 1992 and after the end of communism and therefore the Yugoslav Federation was broken up. These four states came out of the Federation. And they started fighting with each other. And for all of us, it was a nonsense. And Mitterrand uh, said, either we invent something as the Yugoslav Federation was, or there won't be any solution because at their level, they will conflict with each other. Therefore, they have to enter into the European community. So we could not invent a new Yugoslav Federation, but we had an umbrella the European community and this umbrella should cover also this new country. It has not happened as yet, but it is what uh, was necessary and he was the first one to indicate this solution in the, in the early 90s. So, I mean, personalities are more important. I didn't know him personally, but think of Jean Monnet think of Jean Monnet, he's influencing our life uh, even now. Don't go by principles, don't be ideological, don't put uh, European sovereignty versus national sovereignties. You won't get out of the conflict. Say that there is a problem to be solved, pandemics, by vaccines, creating some sort of strategic autonomy to uh, fundamental industries in Europe and create the context of rules of consensus, etc., to solve this problem. This is an essential teaching. And the final teaching to students, young scholars is what led me to write that book 25 years ago? Your studies lead you necessarily into technicalities of the specific matter that you are studying because the information now that is needed to become an expert of something is so uh, wide, so deep, so articulated that you might sink 
into the technical information of the earth specialty uh, look up to what is uh, above these and don't forget what uh, all this matter is about i said it about antitrust it is not about uh, the prices but about power it could be about something else, but there is always some big issue involved in the matters you care. Don't forget about the issue and then take the position you want on the one side or on the other, ready to a reasonable accommodation. And that's the end. Giuliano Amato, thank you very much for sharing your brilliant ideas with us.